that that dark side period is just coming. They're going through their space night, which lasts about 20 minutes uh, in the orbit that they are now in. Uh, they're entering that uh, over the over Africa, and uh, Cernan emerges from the spacecraft, goes to the back of it, uh, back into the adapter. The adapter uh, section of the spacecraft is that section which controls the life support systems and so forth while they're in orbit. And it uh, is jettisoned uh, before retro fire when they return. And right now, it's a solid ring about uh, three feet deep and some 10 feet in diameter. Back in that area, he's got a place where he stands on a foot rail, holds onto a handrail, and then dons this big pack on his back, this 166-pound automatic or astronaut maneuvering unit, which will make him, in a sense, a one-man spaceship with full control capabilities. The first time this unit has ever been used, far more sophisticated than that used by Ed White on his walk. And actually, uh, the question in space is whether, as elaborate a piece of equipment as this, it will be needed, or will a simple handheld unit, such as that Ed White used, be adequate? They won't know that until they've tested this and other units on the this and the next three scheduled Gemini space walks. The next one of those to come up in July, on July 18th, is the present schedule. Cernan should be at this moment, although we are not getting very clear transmissions, scarcely... These are scarcely readable transmissions, as you certainly know. These are still the transmissions between Cernan and Stafford that the ground is monitoring. In this case, they're monitoring at uh, Ascension Island. information, transmission being relayed back to Cape Kennedy and to Houston and eventually to us. And it is not a very readable. So far this flight has proved out just exactly what uh, Ed White uh, had suggested earlier from his short walk, and so far this flight has been very much like Ed White's walk, with a few exceptions. Uh, Cernan has done more out there than White did in the first American spacewalk. He uh, did uh, recover that box uh, with the micrometeorite experiment. He set up the camera. He set up that uh, mirror that you saw that will permit Stafford to watch him as he goes to the back of the spacecraft. And uh, he had tested, as did Ed White, the dynamics of the umbilical cord, what happened when he pulled on it, what, what happened to the spacecraft, and so forth. And uh, now he's getting ready and is going back to the back of the spacecraft uh, to get into that uh, unit during the next 20 minutes and prepare for the further walk in space with his fully controlled maneuvering unit, a one-man spaceship. CBS News color coverage of the Gemini 9 mission will continue in a moment. As America's Gemini heroes whirl through space, they take along equipment specially designed for the Gemini space trips. Among the gear selected was this special toothbrush made by the makers of Picopay toothbrushes. This unique brush is just like the Picopay brush you'd use at home, except it's made with a specially resistant material, material to stand up to the high temperatures and oxygen levels of space. Just as this special Picopay brush goes along on Gemini flights, so this regular Picopay has become the toothbrush more dentists recommend. You see, Picopay was professionally designed to do the best possible job of cleaning your teeth. Every feature was designed to fight cavities. Handle, head, even the tufts are tapered deeper to clean deeper where cavities often start. So remember, for the best possible job of cleaning your teeth, get Picopay, the toothbrush recommended by more dentists. In Houston, Paul Haney is uh, briefing us on what they were able to pick up out of the Ascension Ensuring Pack. Ensuring that the bars are in place, the foot rails and the handrails. And he will check his reaction control system handles very carefully on the AMU before moving on with the flight plan. We uh, press
presently read 50 hours and 10 minutes. The crew has consistently stayed right with the flight plan as written. We expect sunset to occur in the Pretoria area at 50 hours and 15, 16 minutes into the flight, at which point Cernan is to enter the adapter area. Our next acquisition is slated for 50 hours and 13 minutes through Pretoria, South Africa, and uh, followed by an acquisition at Tanana Reeve at 50 hours, 18 minutes. It is uh, unlikely that we would have any voice communication coming back to Pretoria. I think it'll be a monitor, ground monitor only situation. This is Gemini Control, Houston. What Paul, what Paul Haney was... Uh what that transmission is unless it's a tape playback uh, they're not supposed to be in touch with anybody right now that may be the end of the ascension island pass as you know these tracking stations are placed strategically around the globe to keep as, as constant touch with the spacecraft as is possible. But this is not possible given the present state of the uh, radios that can be carried on these spacecraft with weight and uh, space limitations. Uh, we, and with the large ocean spaces and large jungle wastes, well, there just aren't enough uh, tracking stations and ships at sea to keep in touch with them at all times. Uh, so there are some points where signal to them is lost. One of these points is coming right now, and they will <coughs> be out of touch with the Ascension Island station out in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, from there, for about two minutes, to the Pretoria South African station picks them up and carries them along for another eight minutes. Then they're out of touch. Uh, I take that back. Uh, Pretoria and Tanana Reeve station out in the Malagasy Republic, uh, they overlap, and there will be constant communication constant communication with them from uh, about 11.53 Eastern Daylight Time to 12.06. What you're hearing now is Houston contacting Pretoria and Tananarive, uh, checking out communication before the pass. Temperatures and pressures existing in these two suits. In Stafford's suit, pressure uh, at last reading, which was the Cape downrange reading, shows 3.67 pounds per square inch. In the right suit, the Evia Cernan suit, the temperature is running 54.7 degrees. The pressure 3.73 degrees. Meanwhile, the AMU hydrogen peroxide, the gas fuel, which has uh, not yet been activated, the system still is inactive until Tom Stafford turns the switch in the cockpit. That reading shows a very steady 85, which it has run since the beginning of the flight. The peroxide temperature is 71 degrees. This is Gemini Control at Houston. This is the first attempt uh, to assess the uh, value of this hydrogen peroxide uh, in a small unit, such as this uh, astronaut maneuvering unit, and there uh, is a constant monitoring of the pressure and temperature of that hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the substance, uh, very much like uh, ladies used to bonding their hair, used to at any rate, uh, it now uh, is being used as a jet fuel. It turns to steam and uh, can be used to, uh, as thrusters for the spacecraft, uh, for the uh, astronaut maneuvering unit.
Uh, now let's uh, go down to Nelson Benton at uh, Mission Control Center. Uh, he can give us a report on the Cernan and Stafford families on this uh, eventful Sunday morning. Nelson? Uh, Walter, there's a great deal of concentration going on in Mission Control about uh, the EVA, the extravehicular activity, and of course at the homes near Mission Control, the homes of Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan, uh, there's a great deal of concentration. Stafford home, uh, Neil Armstrong's wife. Neil is the... A uh, small child of astronaut Roger Chaffee of that uh, there. However, not everybody's concentrating on the flight. The last report we had from the Cernan home is that little three-year-old Tracy is not watching, is not listening. Uh, she's in the backyard swinging. Walter? Cernan uh, back in the adapter uh, of the spacecraft now as darkness settles down, uh, settles over the uh, spacecraft, which is on an orbit around uh, 185 miles, just about that at which it left its uh, target yesterday. The orbit has a 181 degree uh, apogee, 185 degree, uh, or perigee rather, 185 degree apogee. Target, which still has that shroud on it, which prevented uh, the docking part of this operation, is about 145 miles back of the spacecraft now, as they're over Africa, approaching the coast of Africa, and Cernan, uh, in the dark, is checking out uh, with uh, lights that are provided uh, back in the adapter section, uh, that adapter, uh, and uh, the uh, astronaut maneuvering unit. That 166-pound pack he'll be putting on his back. He sort of sits in that uh, pack and uh, has full maneuvering capability with it. That is pitch, roll, yaw, forward, back, out of plane translations. That is out of the, the present uh, orbit uh, if he so desires. He's not going to do anything like that uh, today, of course. Uh, this unit would provide, presumably, uh, a, if it proves out, as well as they expect it to today, uh, the capability for an astronaut to perform independently in space. Uh, the astronauts themselves would love to try that, and they just might get a chance on later Gemini missions. But until they've proved out to this system a lot, uh, 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 on a lot more flights, uh, they're not going to let the astronaut loose. Uh, Cernan will be at the end of a 125-foot long nylon line, which does not have any capability to carry oxygen or communications to him, but is simply a safety cable, in effect, to keep him from floating away from the spacecraft. He will, uh, he backs into this AMU, as you see Miles McClure, our McDonnell uh, suit engineer, uh, demonstrating for us here in this remarkable simulation that McDonnell and CBS have built here in St. Louis. Uh, he will then, uh, as he emerges from that uh, short while, move up on the back of the spacecraft and uh, will then move forward. He'll get out in front of the spacecraft and with his maneuvering unit, he will uh, go forward and uh, back sideways, up and down. And finally, after two hours and a half in space, he will return to the spacecraft and the hatches will be closed again. Yes, yes. At the moment, the hatch is down to within just a two or a three inch opening, just enough to protect that uh, umbilical cord on which a certain is still connected. Uh, he will, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, not be using that umbilical, as we suggested, when he gets out on the end of that nylon rope in another 20 or 30 minutes. We'll be standing by here at CBS News Space Center, McDonnell Aircraft, ready to report as developments warrant, and we'll be back to report the final phase of Eugene Cernan's walk in space at approximately 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Walter Cronkite, CBS News. The Week in Space. CBS News selective coverage of the mission of Gemini 9. Next, a report on the conclusion of the walk in space when CBS News coverage resumes at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time.